Hi, family. How are y'all? I'm excited to be back. It's been a little bit. I mean, I was teaching yesterday. I love School of Ministry so much. How many School of Ministry students do we have in here? Oh, quite a few. Yeah, we have fun. Tuesday nights are different because, and it's kind of like a Wednesday night, you know, because it's not the normal crowd. It's kind of the people that are really hungry. So I'm excited to share what God's laid on my heart. Um, <laughs> have you ever like tried to get out of a season, but God's like, no, you're still in the season. You can't get out of it yet. You know what I mean? And I feel like the season that he's got me in right now is obedience. I feel like everything that everything that I talk about has kind of a tone of obedience to it. So today, the message we're going to talk about, what we're going to talk about is present obedience, present obedience. It's, it's funny because, I don't know, did anybody in here have to learn things the hard way sometimes? <laughs> like, I, I, growing up, my mom was right so much of the time, and I thought she was wrong, and so I, I mean, so many things. For, this is a recent example. It's not me, it's my kids, but it's funny how we have kids and you like see it kind of replay out. My kids yesterday, they wanted to run to the store to go get some snacks. And we had got home late. It was probably close to 10, about 9.50. And Pastor Shane was like, uh, he said, the store's closed. And they're like, no, we just passed it. The lights are on. The lights are on. I'm sure that it's open. And we, I was like, okay, I believe him. But if you want to go, you know, do that, that sure, like have, have at it. They drove all the way there and it was cold outside. They drove all the way there in the cold car, <laughs> got out, it was, it was closed. And I'm just like, I remember those moments that I've had with the Lord and I, that I've had, it's like, man, if I would have just listened, I would have avoided all of the issues. So I'm glad I'm not the only one in the room. Um, Cause you know, here's the thing, like it's easy to talk about something that you feel like you already are past, you know, like it's easy to tell somebody, yeah, I used to struggle with that a long time ago. It's hard to say, you know what, let me share a little bit about where I'm at right now, you know, because it's kind of vulnerable to share about something that you don't feel like you've got down 100%, you know, and, and sometimes it can make you feel like a hypocrite, but you're not, you're only a hypocrite if you lay down and you give up. And so I don't know if there's some people in here that you know, you, you feel like you've been beat down and you get back up and you get beat down. Listen, if you're still in the fight, you're going to win. It's when you step out of the fight, that's when there's problem, you know? And so, okay, well, let me just say this. I love Pastor John and Pastor Trish, and I'm so grateful that they even let me be up here. So Pastor Trish is at home watching, I know. Can we just pray for her real quick? She's, she's just, man, recovering from a sickness. So y'all just, y'all help me pray for her real quick, Okay. Father, we just lift up Pastor Trish to you. God, we just speak healing to her and healing to so many of our congregation that are just feeling kind of under the weather. Father, I pray that, God, I pray, I pray healing in such a sweet, sweet way, God, that there would even be um, divine revelation about you being our healer, Lord, that, God, I love that every trial, it turns into an encounter if we let it, God, that we can get to know you in a new way. So, Father, we speak healing over her and over, we plead the blood of Jesus over her. We play, plead the blood of Jesus over our congregation from the top of their head to the soles of their feet down to the cellular level of their bodies, God. We thank you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, okay, as I, was, as I was kind of praying about this, I felt the Lord lay this one on me, okay? And I'm gonna say it two different ways. Is that me? Am I doing something? I'm sorry if I am. Okay, let me, let me just, and I've been thinking about it for a while, so I'm gonna lay this on y'all, see if y'all can think about it with me. Obedience is surrender in action. Obedience is the act of surrender, right? I, it's funny because sometimes I think we separate obedience and surrender, and I'm learning so hard. Well, I'm learning so, like a lot. I used to try so hard to do all the right things, and I was that person that like, I felt like I, if I did enough, it would add to my value, you know? Like, I've gotta do more and more and more, and then if, if I let go of any of that, then I was less valuable, which is not true. Obviously, it's not true. But I really believe that life for such a long time, that surrendering was very difficult. In fact, I remember a particular weekend where the Lord kept telling me to rest. And I was like fasting and praying for strongholds to come down. I didn't know what a stronghold was. I just knew we were supposed to demolish them, right? Like, 
and it, I, I didn't know it was a thought process, but I was praying and fasting and all this stuff, and I kept telling the Lord, or I, hear, I kept hearing the Lord tell me to rest, 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 and I was like, what? Like, no, I'm fasting, like, we gotta go, you know? So funny, it's, it's kind of offensive when you tell somebody who is a doer to rest, am I right? Does anybody else struggle with that sometimes? Yeah, okay, all right, so, the, okay, as I was doing this study, I was looking up surrender in scripture, and it's very interesting because surrender in scripture, you're not gonna, you'll find that word, but it means more like a war script, like a war surrender, right? Like you're in war and you raise the white flag surrender, and that is part of the definition, But I thought it very interesting that the main way that they use the word surrender is humility. It's humility. It's it's the bowing of a knee. It's the bringing one under. It's the coming low. And I feel like sometimes in seasons with the Lord, he's not just after the outward action of obedience. He's after the inward heart posture of surrender. Because when you surrender and you truly surrender, it builds a history with him. And, and then you can have that history and you can walk it out and that history builds on itself just like you remember David and Goliath. David, David would have never been able to beat Goliath if he had not first killed the lion and the bear. If that had not, and he says, the Lord delivered me out of their hand. He, count, he attributed that victory to the Lord. And let me, this is totally a side note, it's not in my notes at all and we're, I'm about to like dive, we're about to dive in more because I'm just, I'm so excited to share this, but um. I don't know where I was going, so I'll just get back to my notes. <laughs> I was going to try to make something. <laughs> it's just whatever. I can't. I can't do it. I can't do it. All right. So what are our, I'll, I'll remember it in a minute because it was really good. Like it was going to be like so good, but it's gone. We'll find it later. So what are our main, what are the main enemies to surrender? And, and why do we want to surrender? Why is this such a big deal? Can I just tell you that surrendering to the Lord and being obedient when you don't understand is the bedrock that faith grows? Like it is, when you step out in faith, it's, it's such a huge deal. And it's funny because he's not even after the action, he's after your heart, but faith without works is dead. So it's like, okay, we've got to partner those two things together. And I've never thought about it like God not only just wanting the outward action. Uh, I'll tell you a story, okay. And we're not supposed to say, I'm not fasting right now. I'm not fasting right now. So I'm not like trying to say, hey, I'm fasting and look at me. Okay, I'm not doing that. Yesterday though, after we were done with school ministry, I was so hungry. I was so hungry. I said it from the stage even, I'm so hungry. And I, I felt the Lord say, we need to fast tonight. And I was like, is that you, Lord? Like, was it? Are you sure? <laughs> so I'm, I'm processing this and I end up talking to somebody after and we're, we're kind of in a conversation and I'm thinking like, <laughs> okay, Lord, are you really wanting me to fast? Can you just, I'm gonna look at my clock and if there's a three on, the, on my watch, on the clock, then, then I'll know that you wanna fast. And me, when, as I'm thinking this, the person I'm talking to says, there's three of me and my friends, there's three of us, we're fasting. And I was like, hang on, <laughs> hang on. How, how many, how many did you say? Well, it's me, it's two other people and me, so there's three. And I was like, great, on. <laughs> point taken, point taken, Lord, point taken. But see, my day was totally different today on the other side of the obedience. It was, and and it's not because I've missed opportunities like that too. And his mercy is new every morning. So he made something there too, right? Like there's, there's, but it's so much sweeter to be. You don't want the bitterness of being on the other side of disobedience because that's sour. That is so sour. So what are some enemies of obedience, enemies of surrender? Number one, pride. We think we know better than God. We wouldn't say it like that, though. We wouldn't say it like that. Sometimes the way pride looks in our lives is God will say, hey, I want you to start a community group. No, Lord, I could not do that. I couldn't do that. And I'm not telling you to start a community group. I'm just saying sometimes us thinking we know better than God as if he hasn't already like seen it and given you what you need in your hand to do what you've been called to do, that's pride. It's it's, it's pride to push away from the grace of God as if his blood is not powerful enough to cover it. You know, like just step into it. If he's called you to it, he's gonna lead you through it, number one. But he's also gonna equip you and it's gonna be a joy. It's, it's, it may stretch you, but it's not outside of your realm of capabilities. And if it is, he's gonna meet you there too. Like, 
There's just, there's no way you can fail in obedience. There's not one. And here's the other thing about pride, you know, deceived people don't know you're deceived. And this is why community is so important because we all have blind spots. Every single one of us do. And if you think you don't, you're in trouble. And if you don't have somebody in your life that can tell you, hey, you've got an issue right here, then you're in trouble. You need to come in closer. We don't do life alone. There's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. And listen, the blind spots are really subtle. The enemy never shows up on your doorstep and says, hey, give me the next 10 years of your life. He just says, you want to take this hit? You just want this one? This one look won't make a difference. Isn't it funny? He's so subtle. And sometimes he's not. So here's the second thing, the second enemy of obedience, procrastination. Delayed obedience is still disobedience. I will tell you that probably this one has robbed more from me than any of the, and and of course I've like dealt with pride and stuff too. In fact, I actively pray, Lord, if I ever do anything in pride, will you just humiliate me? Like I would rather be humiliated than be prideful and walk away thinking I did something great. Like, how stupid is that? You know, I would rather be humiliated, and I genuinely mean that. Um, but procrastination, I, I used to believe the lie that if God said, you know what, I want you to fast. Oh, yes, Lord, I'll start tomorrow. And not thinking, like, I would discount the present moment that I'm in. I would discount the present opportunity of obedience because the only time we've ever really had is right now. The only moment you've ever had is this one. Tomorrow is an illusion. In fact, the Bible calls it arrogant whenever we say, I'll do this tomorrow, I'll do that tomorrow. Like, this is so stupid. This is probably like a religious thing, but um, uh, at Southcrest, one of our kids goes to Southcrest. I could tell you a story about that. Like, no, she, she I mean, she, don't judge me. I don't know what to tell you. It, life is complicated. We have a bunch of kids. I can't, whatever. We'll talk, you have a question about it, I don't care. Well, I mean, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, but so one of the, one of the shirts says class of, it's like 30 or, or 2032 or something. Is that what it is? 20, it's like 2032. And I can't for the life of me bring myself to buy that shirt because I'm like religious about it. Maybe. I don't know. It's like, Lord, if you're willing, I don't know. Like, I just, I can't buy it. I feel like it's an arrogant shirt. Does anybody have any weird, like, religious cows or something that you can't really explain to other people? Should I not have shared that? We're not friends anymore because I shared it. Well, okay. You could, yeah, it's, we could talk about it later. I don't know what to tell you. It's complicated. Okay, here's, here's what the Bible says about obedience. Let's go to John 14, okay? Starting in verse 12, I can guarantee this truth. Those that believe in me will do the things I am doing. They will even do greater things because I am going to the Father. I will do anything you ask. The Father in my name so that the Father will be giving glory to the Son. If you ask me to do something, I'll do it. Listen up, okay? If you love me, you will obey my commandments. He doesn't really pull any punches here. And it's like, sometimes the enemy likes to twist this, right? And we think, at least for me, and I'll get back to this in just a second, the more that I do correctly, the more God will love me. You can't measure God's love for you by your performance. You measure it by the cross. That's the only accurate tool to measure his love for you was Jesus dying on the cross. It's not performance. Now what our actions and our obedience and our surrender does do is it shows us how much we love God. Because it's so easy to deceive ourselves. Well, I love God. Like I go to church every Sunday. Okay, but are you... Do you have an intimate relationship with him during the week? Does his heart matter to you when you're watching what you're watching? Do you take into account what he thinks about the music you listen to? Is there a mark of obedience, a mark in your life where people said, wow, like there is obedience there? Has your life been marked by a repentance, a turning away from what once was? Because if there hasn't, I just want to encourage you, you're missing out on something so sweet. Because if all salvation is, is a ticket to heaven, I mean, honestly, this is, this is probably a dumb way to say this, but I don't know any other way to say it. I wouldn't change the trajectory of my life if heaven was not real. 
because I love him too much. Like I would live, day, how I live day to day, this would be enough. Heaven is cake. Heaven is icing on the top. Do you know what I mean? Like, yes, heaven is real. Of course it's real. It, he says it all the time. If some of the, if none of, if some of the Bible's not true, then none of it's true, right? If the, if he says that if the scriptures about giving aren't true, then the scriptures about heaven aren't true either. We, but it's this like, you're missing out on something so sweet and your life is harder than it has to be. And I'm not saying that it's easier with God, but I'm saying that he's always there in the moment and he doesn't leave you or forsake you. It means he doesn't take his attention off of you and he doesn't turn his heart away either. And he's constantly beckoning us to be closer to him. But sometimes we are so easily satisfied. C.S. Lewis says it like this. We are, we are, we're so easily, or we're, we're, we're satisfied playing in the mud when there is a holiday at sea. And what I think of when I hear that quote is like a cruise at Christmas time. Right, like we got to go on a cruise one time and we didn't think that, um, we took Boston with us when she was young. She was like, I don't know, three or four or something. No, five, I don't remember. Math is hard, I don't know. Um, but we were, we were on a cruise. We didn't think that the, the um, what were they, the characters? They were the, Ses not Sesame Street, Dr. Seuss. We didn't think the Dr. Seuss characters were gonna be on the thing, but they were, they were there and it was so amazing. I think of that quote in terms of just playing in the mud at the beach or being at sea. But see, the thing about this is like, it's hard to imagine what God really has from us because we think of it from, we think of it from this place of deficit and it's hard to want something that you don't know is available. It's, it would be hard for somebody in a third world country who has not had electricity to play roadblocks. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? Like, how do they even know to ask for that? And it's like stepping out in faith with God, it's this amazing thing where he invites you into places that you didn't even dream that you would ever walk. And it may not even include a stage. It may include a towel and a rag. And that place is just as valuable as anything we would do up here. He has something for you. And it's not a generic thing that your mom had or your grandma had. It's something for you, for you. He has something for you. And any time that he's inviting you deeper, any time he asks you to give something up, it is not to take away from you. It is to give to you. He's trying to reveal his heart to you. And that's the part of denying ourselves that sometimes we don't know how to do in the moment. So let's pick up where we'll go to verse 18. He says, I will not leave you alone. I will come back to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. You will live because I live. On that day, you will know that I am my father, that I am in my father, and that you are in me, and that I am in you. We're involved in this. This is not like a um, cheesy scripture. This, this beautiful picture of the Trinity, we have a role in that to play. It's incredible to me what we've been invited into. Um, okay. Verse 21, whoever knows and obeys my commandments is the person who loves me. Those that love me will have my father's love and I too will love them and show myself to them. And, and Judas, not Iscariot, but the other one, asked Jesus, Lord, what has happened that you're gonna reveal yourself to us and not the world? And he answered him, those that love me will do what I say. My father will love them and we will go to them and make our home with them. A person doesn't love me, uh, who, a person who doesn't love me doesn't do what I say. I don't make up what you hear me say. What I say comes from the father who sent me. It is stout. But it's so important. We wouldn't be doing our jobs if we didn't say that. If you like, and this is not, by the way, a thing to take and say, to sit with the enemy and where he can tell you every way that he's failed. Because in just a second, I'm gonna show you, it is not what it looks like. It, okay, it's not what it looks like. Let's keep going. So God's love language is obedience. God's love language, according to John 14, is obedience, okay? So here's the third thing that, um, the third enemy of obedience, spiritual slumber, Spiritual slumber. Um, this looks like sleep. Has I, I've been thinking about this lately. The word talks a lot about believers that have fallen asleep. If you think about what sleep is in the natural, it's you're not aware of things that are going on around you, but you're there. You're not dead, but you're inactive. You're not dead, but you're unaware. You're, 
you're sleeping through it. And it's like, I wonder spiritually sometimes how often we sleep through things not realizing all the elements at work. Yeah. And it's like, well, well, how do you wake somebody up then? You have to jolt them sometimes, right? Like, hey, wake up. I mean, you don't hit them. You can dump water on them. Um, it wouldn't be a fun time afterwards, I would assume. But sometimes in order to wake people up, you have to jolt them. Like there has to be some kind of a jolting. And sometimes in our lives when the Lord will use circumstances, good and bad, because what does it say? It says he uses all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose, right? Um, he uses all of those things to try to wake his kids up because spiritual slumber is dangerous. It's dangerous and you're missing out. And I, I feel like even in our culture, sometimes the church at large has been asleep and this is where we are now. The struggle has been so strong and we were just inactive and just sitting there. And I think the church is waking up, but sometimes it takes a kind of shaking to wake people up. Does that make sense? The second kind of thing that spiritual slumber can look like is busyness. You can be incredibly busy in the natural realm, but asleep in the spiritual realm. You can be busy in church in the natural realm and still be asleep in the spiritual realm. And by the way, that's not hopeless information. That's actually really helpful information because then it's like, okay, Lord, am I awake? Am I aware of what you're doing around me, doing through me through the day? Have I, do I go from task to task to task and never think to ask you, Lord, is there anything you want me to do? And sometimes the reason why we don't ask the Lord, do I have an assignment in Walmart? Do I have an assignment here? Is because we don't think we're valuable enough or powerful enough to make a difference. I'm gonna tell you, you can shake and rattle the gates of hell. You can shake and rattle them. You have been called to do that. Your voice matters. And so many people have had their voices stripped from them. Can I tell you that he wants to give you your voice back? Your voice matters. Your voice matters. Your discernment matters. What you feel going into something. Sometimes you feel stuff and you go into places. Some, I don't, I, this may be for just one person. Maybe it's for more than one. You get anxious being around a lot of people. And it's because you're feeling other people's emotions and you can't distinguish between the two. It is a gift that God gave you to discern what's going on. And if you invite him into the conversation and you stop accusing yourself, oh, I'm just crazy. He will help you with that. He will help. That is a gift to the body of Christ. Everyone in here, like your voice matters. You walking through Walmart should shake the gates of hell, not because you're going to go preach to everyone, but because you're in tune with the spirit of God and maybe some person just needs a smile. Maybe, I mean, never discount the, the, a smile. You don't know the battle that people are fighting sometimes in their head and just making eye contact with them and smiling at them, which by the way, was taken for a long time where we couldn't even see each other's facial expressions. Don't tell me that we did not get less socially, um, you know, acclimated to each other things got real weird after covid we were socially awkward for a while we had some pretty good mishaps here at the church like where we did really weird things you know like pastor jocelyn's my favorite story i won't demonstrate it because i love her very much but hers is my very favorite my point is this most of jesus's miracles happened on the way don't discount your on the way. Okay? Here's the last thing. Distracted. Let me just hit on this real quick. Okay? Social media will lull you to sleep. Social media, is a, it can be the, one of the most biggest distractions. We say like, well, I don't have time to do this. I don't have time to do that. Check your battery life and check. Do you actually, have, do you actually not have time or have you wasted your time? Because listen, it's a very helpful thing to know if you wasted your time because then you can pivot. You're the steward of your time, right? I'm the steward of my time, so I get to pivot that. If I'm not satisfied with how I'm spending my time, guess what, baby? We could change it, yeah. you know? And we can say, okay, Lord, show me how to spend my time. Show me how to do this. But I, I cannot get away from it, guys. Like, it's kind of exhausting sometimes. I know it is for Shane, but like, I think, I think all the time, like in generation... Um, I, I can't just think in this moment. I think in terms of what is this going to influence for the next decision, especially with my kids. 
so when I see myself like getting stuck on my phone, because anybody ever lost like hours? You look up and it's been hours, like hours. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it's because they created TikTok, they created Facebook. Hi, Facebook. I know you're watching. I see you. Like, this is great. I'm glad you're on, you know? Like, I'm not trying to call you out. I'm being genuinely serious, like, or genuine, I guess. They created these social media things to be addictive. And little kids fall way more susceptible to that. So I think, okay, my grandkids one day, are they gonna have a present parent or am I sitting idly by while my kids become addicted to this rectangle? And it feels like a whole war against it because culture pulls you towards it. You know, it's like, oh, and, and anyways, it's like, I could get off on a whole thing, but think about, think about the implications. What do you want your, your kids to parent like? What one generation tolerates, the next does in excess. What are you tolerating? I, they have picked up some bad habits for me. And even like, I like to, whenever I cook, I don't know, it's like kind of weird. I don't like being around people and it should be like a, oh, come in, like be cozy with me. Let me teach you how to stir it. I'm like, no, like I just need to get it done. I don't want to be in here. I certainly don't want to teach you how to do it because I, I don't really know how to do it. Legit, I used to make my own spaghetti sauce, okay? Let me just tell you, I'm not a great cook. I don't know what to say about it. I'm not a good driver either. You can't be good at everything. I don't know what to say. Like, I made, I made my own spaghetti sauce and I thought I was balling. Like the tomatoes, I put the, like a little bit of sugar in there, just a little, like I put the herbs. Boston goes to my neighbor's house who has, she's, she comes back, she's like, they had the best spaghetti. It was so good. And I was like, oh, that's great. That's stupid. Oh, awesome. Like, and then I asked my neighbor, what did you, like, how did you put that in there? Micah, if you're watching, what's up? Like, Boston loves your spaghetti. You know, like, if I, I asked her, like, how did you make that? And she's like, oh, it's just a can. You just dump it in there. And I was like, hey, right, whatever. Like, I, I don't even know. Like, to this day, I don't make the homemade spaghetti sauce anymore. I gave up. I was like, this is a waste of time. <laughs> waste of time. She told me one day that the school's green beans were better than mine, and I don't know what to say about that. I'm kind of ashamed to admit it. Like, I know that y'all are like, well, I'm for sure not coming over to your Thanksgiving invitation. I'm not cooking. I'm not cooking it, so I don't know what to tell you. It's rude, is what they are. They're tiny little rude humans that need to get it together. Make your own spaghetti. Okay. So there's some things to be aware of. Now, how then, what is the key to obedience, right? What is the key? Whew. I'm going to try to get through this one without crying. This is like had me destroyed all day. Um, the key to obedience is remembering your first love. It's not trying harder. It's just not. It's just not. You know, M- Melissa Medina came and she shared at Pink one day and she was talking about dove's eyes. And, you know, Song of Solomon, um, it talks about having dove's eyes, her, that her eyes are like doves. And I never really knew what that meant. I mean, and, I, I did kind of, but I just, it was like one of those things that you know, but you never knew. And she started talking about how they don't have peripheral vision. And so that got me then. And I asked the Lord, or I, I kind of, maybe I told him, I don't know, but I kind of asked him, like, what's your heart for me for my I just turned like 36 or something or 37 um, or 36. And the Lord was like, I want this next year of your life to have you to have dove's eyes for me, like to focus on me. And I had talked to somebody who had just done like a media fast. They didn't watch TV. They didn't do, they, they, they cut everything off. And I had already been feeling that. So it was like confirmation. Okay, Lord, I need to like, I feel you calling me deeper. And can I tell you sometimes like there's levels of following the Lord where it's, you walk away, you're not doing anything like overtly sinful, you know? But then, then he comes and he asks for things that aren't sinful, but they waste your time. Yeah. And he's not trying to take something away from you. He's trying to invite you into a deeper reality. And it costs more time. It is costly. It does cost you everything. Yes. And it's like, those moments are where part of you dies because you think, well, I... If I can't unwind after a hard day, like, what am I supposed to do? Like, I feel like I need that time to, like, chill and to unwind. And he's like, I'll show you a better way if you want me to. Like, I'll help you do that if you want me to. Like, has he ever come for something that isn't bad? 
but it's something that you know that is just distracting you a little. Like that's the season that I'm in and it's, it's a good season, but it's also like, man, Lord, it's hard for me to go to the other side of that sometimes because some of my counterfeits work or they did work. At least they worked somewhat, right? Like maybe I'm feeling stressed and I go have some ice cream. That ice cream, it worked right then, it did. Now, it may, I may pay a price later for it, but it worked in the moment. Like the things that I turn to, sometimes they seem like they work, but then they end up costing me later. And it's still a counterfeit regardless. And he's like, I want to show you something deeper than this. Because being in ministry and like loving and leading you all, like doing the school, it's so humbling to me but I can't lead anywhere somewhere I haven't been. And so there has to be somebody paying the price to pave the way. And thank God we have Pastor Todd and Pastor Trish that do that on a regular basis, that like show us what's possible, right? That show us what obedience looks like, that show us what surrender looks like. And then we can see some of the fruit of it and then we can imagine ourselves doing, okay, what would this look like in my life if I gave everything? The other thing I was searching, let me take a drink. The other thing, you know how doves always like do the, I, there's a reason for that. I didn't know there was a reason for that. So it says it doves are distinguished by the constant bobbing of their heads. The reason why they do that, um, it's been interpreted as a means of maintaining balance due to the position of their legs, but also they have to continuously refocus their eyesight to see objects clearly. And that stuck out to me so much because I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like I have to constantly readjust. Like I feel like something will come here and I'm like, no, Lord, I want to look at you. And I'll get distracted. I'm like, no, 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 it'll focus up. Like I want to be right here, you know? And it's like this really sweet thing. Like I know this is going to be hard for you, but you don't have to beat yourself up when you're trying to look at me. If you'll just come back to me, you don't have to allow shame to make you go hide from me. When you fail, just look at me. I know this is going to be hard for you. I know the kind of world you're living in. I lived it. And I did that so I could be your high priest with that understanding of what you've gone through. It's amazing what he does. So let's go real quick to Revelation 2, 1 through 5. We're going to, it's, so this is a letter to the church of Ephesus. It's a church. I guess it's not really a letter. Yeah, it is a letter. It says, right. It says, thus says the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks in the midst of the seven gold, some minrot, I don't know, minrot, I don't even know what that is. I should look it up. I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, I know all about your deeds and your toil and your patient endurance and that you cannot bear those who are evil. You've tested those who call themselves emissaries and are not. You found them to be liars. You have pers- you have uh, perseverance and endured for my name's sake and you have not grown weary. It sounds like they're doing all the right things, you know? Like if, if the Lord starts out and he's telling me that, I'm gonna feel like, man, I've like, yes, I've been doing it. You know, I'm doing the thing. But then he gets to this next part, but I have this against you, that you've forsaken your first love. Remember then from where you have fallen. Repent and do the deeds you did at first. If not, I will come to you and renew, remove your menorah from its place unless you repent. And I know that there are people in here way smarter than me that could preach their faces off with this. But the part that I want to like, highlight right here is go back to the first love. We get so tangled sometimes in religion And it trips us up and we don't meet our own expectations of what we think God wants from us. And then we beat ourselves up. And then we allow shame to make us hide in the corner. And he's saying, listen, remember your first love. Remember your first love. I'm still here. I still want this connection with you. And it's not based on your performance. It's based on the blood of Jesus. Man, it just, it seems like they were doing all the right things. Let's go to Matthew 7, 21 through 23. This is one of the most terrifying scriptures to me, but I've, the more that I've studied it, it's, it's a little bit less so, but it still just gets me. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father in heaven. 
Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and drive out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. He says, those that do the will of my Father in heaven. Well, they were just doing a lot of the things that I would, I would list out if I'm thinking, what is your will, Lord? Casting out demons. I, it seems like they're doing the right thing, doesn't it? So then what is he talking about? What did they miss? What is the piece that they missed? He says, I never knew you. I never, I never knew you. And it's not a know you, it's a know you. It's the, it's the way that Adam knew Eve and bore a son. There is always some kind of fruit, some kind of evidence when there's intimacy with the Lord. There's always evidence. And so whenever we don't see it, that's, we don't have to condemn ourselves, but it's so helpful to know, listen, if you don't have in evidence, fruit of true intimacy, then I want to invite you deeper, invite you deeper. There's deeper waters. Don't be satisfied playing in the mud. There's something deeper for you. He wants something deeper for you. It's interesting to me because I look at that as well. There's another part. There's another scripture that says, these are the signs that will follow my believers. They will cast out demons. They will do these. They will do this stuff. It says, these are the signs. Interesting, because it's like, okay, well, they've got the signs, right? They've got the signs. But it reminds me of Mark 11 when Jesus was walking by a fig tree. And there was a fig tree. And he goes and he wants fruit off of this fig tree. Now, it wasn't the season for figs. But... He went up to it, there was no figs on it, and he cursed the fig tree, and the fig tree withered and dried up from the root. I was studying this because I was like, Lord, there was, it wasn't the season for figs. So why did you get upset? And as I was studying it out, it's because the leaves that it had showed, it signified fruit. Those particular leaves were a sign that there was fruit on the tree. And there wasn't any fruit on the tree. And so he, he cursed the tree and said, nobody's ever going to eat of you again. And it dried up. And sometimes I feel like in my life, I've had the, the leaves of fruit, but not real fruit. And then those moments feel really dry. And it feels really empty, you know. So let's go to a different, we're going to keep going. I'll just read this like it is how I heard it. It says, sometimes we get caught up trying to make signs happen instead of letting them just be the fruit of what he told us to do, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. We go back to that. It says, you didn't do the Lord's will. Well, if the Lord's will is not casting out demons, cleansing the lepers, preaching the God, if it's not those things, then what is it? He says it very clearly in Matthew 25. Nope. In Matthew 22, um, he says, and I'm just going to skip down to verse 37. They're asking him, which one of the commandments is the greatest commandment? I'm so thankful that they asked him that question. I know that they did it with impure motives as the Sadducees, but that's a very useful question. Which one of the commandments is the most important? And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. I don't know if strength is listed right here in Matthew's version. It is in others. He's saying, listen, your job, and love your neighbor as yourself is the second part of that, but your job is to give your whole self to me. I'm not looking for your performance. And that's such a freeing thing to know because we're not gonna be good enough. Like when Jesus died on the cross, he exposed our need for a savior so we don't have to pretend like we're gonna be good enough. It's so silly. It's so silly. We end up like the hamster on the wheel and we're not going anywhere, you know? So here's the last little part and then we're gonna close up. In Matthew 25, and this is what's like been stirring in my heart, is this parable of the 10 virgins. And, and I want to just, this, this whole conversation that's happening, he's kind of talking about the end of the world, and he's, or not end of the world, he's talking about him coming back. And they're having these conversations, and then he tells this parable. We're going to process through this together. It says, then the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. 
Five of them were foolish, five were wise. For when the foolish ones took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise ones took oil in jars along their lamps, along with their lamps. Now, while the bridegroom was taking a long time, they all got drowsy and started falling asleep. But in the middle of the night, there was a shout, look, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Look, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins got up, trimmed their lamps. Now the foolish ones said to the wise, give give us some of your oil since our lamps are going out. But the wise ones replied, no, there's not enough for us and you. Instead, go to those who sell and buy some for yourselves. But while they were going off to buy, the bridegroom came and those that were ready to go in with him went into the wedding feast and the door was shut. And later the other virgins came saying, sir, sir, open up for us. But he replied, amen, I tell you, I do not know you. Therefore, stay alert for you neither know the day or the hour. What's the other place in scripture that we read tonight that says, I do not know you? It was up above, right? Whenever we were talking about, Lord, I did this in your name. I did this in your name. He says, depart from me. I never knew you. See, I've been praying about, Lord, what are you, what were you communicating whenever we were talking about these, these 10 virgins? Because they represent the church. The 10 virgins, they represent the church. Half of them took extra oil and half of them didn't. And when I read that, I think, well, gosh, you're selfish for not giving your oil. Like, just share it, you know? Like, probably, surely you don't need the lamps when you go into the the place, right? There's going to be some kind of lamps or something there. Surely there's lighting in there. It's a wedding ceremony. You know, you're waiting outside. Like, I think about it. And as I was praying about it today, I felt like the Lord said, Dijon, everybody has to pay their own price for their oil. You have to pay your own price for your oil. And the oil represents the spirit of God. We all have to pay their own price. And what that looks like is surrender and obedience. When was the last time you brought more of your heart to God? When was the last time I brought more of my heart? Because it's easy to bring a portion and then we get comfortable there. And then it's like, he says, okay, but I want you to come a little bit deeper, but you're gonna have, you're gonna have to leave that behind. And then we wrestle with ourselves a little bit, you know? And it's like, okay, but ugh, I, I wanna take that. Like it's, it's worked in the past and it's, there's an invitation tonight to go deeper into his heart. I don't know what things that you guys are struggling with or what, where you're at tonight, but can I just tell you, like, I have been so burdened all day to come and tell you that he loves you and that there is more for you than what you've experienced so far. There is true power and authority in your hands and he wants to show you what it looks like to surrender on a deeper level, maybe one that you've never surrendered before. And it's like, man, well, I say, you know, you say, well, I I haven't been a believer very long, you know? Or maybe you say, well, I've been a believer for decades at this point. Either one, either one, you can come deeper. Either one, there's more to know about him. And sometimes we're so easily satisfied. You know, do you find yourself, well, I'm busy, I am busy. You know, I'm so busy. What if you could take some stuff off your plate? What if things were move aroundable? You get to decide. Everybody has 24 hours in a day. Well, I'm sleepy. Okay, well, he says, come to me. Those that are weary, I'll give you rest. When we use the tools that God gives us in an incorrect way, we don't achieve what he gave it to us for. Sleep is not a way, a doorway, a door, a doorway to rest, not to this kind of rest. Physical, natural sleep is not the doorway to the rest that you're looking for. There's something so much deeper. Control is not the way to peace. Surrender is the way to peace. 
because he's a person. And I love that he says the most important commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. You know why? Because God is love. He is love. It is impossible to love without him. Love is not just something God has, it's who he is. The Bible doesn't say that God is peace. He is peace, but it, it, this specific way that they say it, God is love. It is love. And because we are his, we can offer that love. But more importantly, we can receive it ourselves. So if you feel like, man, I have been really hard on myself and I feel like I've just been ashamed of where I'm at or I feel like Lord, I have failed you just time and time again. I want to tell you there is grace up here. His mercy is new. He knew that it would be hard. It's okay to come. And if you say, well, man, I'm not doing anything wrong necessarily, but I just feel kind of complacent with the Lord. I want to invite you to come because he's, in, he's calling you deeper. And maybe he's calling you to give up something that's good not because he wants to take it from you, but because he wants to give you something better. So we're gonna sing one last worship song. And I just wanna invite everybody to stand. Everyone stand for me. And I just wanna give an invitation. If you feel like I want to go deeper, I don't want to stay where I'm at. I want to know what it's like to walk in authority and boldness. I want to give more of my heart to you. Any of those things, I want to invite you to come. This is just an invitation to go deeper. Father, we want to go deeper. God, we want to give more of ourselves away, God. We don't want to stay where we are. God, I pray, Lord, we repent for complacency. We repent, God, for being asleep. We repent, God, for sitting idly by when you have called us to do something, Father. I pray, Lord, that those that are trapped in shame, that literally it's chained to their ankles, I ask that that would be broken right now in the name of Jesus. That even people that, that struggle with depression and you just feel like an overall failure, I break that in the name of Jesus, regardless if they came down here or not. Father, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you, God.